You hear me? All right. How oh, the spirit calls and blinded eyes to see Gather round my precious jewels Separate yourself to me Thank you for everything you've done for us through the past week. Father, we ask for your protection. We ask for your mercy 
Father, we ask that you visit with us, send your spirit of understanding, give us the strength to follow in your footsteps, and let us see your truth for what they are, and let us understand your way of life. We give you thanks and ask all of this in Yeshua's name. Baruch haba Hashem Yahweh, blessed is He, comes in the name of Yahweh. All right, I guess I'm Rick for today. <laughs> Rick and Evelyn are still traveling, so keep them in your prayers. If you have any prayers or praise requests, if you would please just write them on one of the post-it notes, and stick it on our little bulletin board there, and Deborah will collect them for you and uh, get them in a bulk email. If you're not on our emailing list for the prayer and praises, um, please see either Deborah, myself, or one of the other elders. We'll get you added to that. Feel free to send a message if you're on uh, the internet congregation there um just a quick note the reason we mail those out uh so that you can pray over them all week long if you feel so led constant persistent prayer that's what scripture tells us to do um one other announcement that i'm aware of i know that we've got the times posted for feasts coming up for the passover and unleavened bread it's on our website but I also want to see about having an elders meeting after the Shabbat study next uh, Sabbath, if we can. So let's see, what's that, 11, 12, yeah, 12 o'clock-ish. As <laughs> soon as we can get everybody together, then it shouldn't take too long. But we do have a little congregational business we need to discuss real quick. Other than that, I think it's time for the readings. If you would like to read, sign up for whatever week you'd like to read. and. Rick likes to say, try to beat um, Caitlin to it. Otherwise, Caitlin, you're up. Get to the clips of the situation. Good afternoon. See. Ah, here we go. Okay, today we are starting in Leviticus 6, 1 through 8, 36. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, If anyone sins and commits a trespass against Yahweh, and deals falsely with his neighbor in a matter of deposit, or of bargain, or of robbery, or has oppressed his neighbor, or has found that which was lost and deals falsely in it, and swears to a lie, in any of all these things that a man does sinning in it, then it shall be, if he has sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took by robbery, or the thing which he has gotten by oppression, or the deposit which was committed to him, or the lost thing which he found, or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in full, and shall add the fifth part more thereto. To him to whom it pertains he shall give it, in the day of his being found guilty. And he shall bring his trespass offering to Yahweh, a ram without blemish out of the flock, according to your estimation, for a trespass offering to the priest. And the priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh, and he shall be forgiven concerning whatever he does, so as to be guilty in it. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night to the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen trousers shall he put on his flesh. And he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has consumed the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments, and put on other garments, and carry forth the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. 
and he shall lay the burnt offering in order on it, and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually, it shall not go out. And this is the law of the meal offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before Yahweh, before the altar. And he shall take up from it his handful of the fine flour of the meal offering, and of the oil of it, and all the frankincense which is on the meal offering, and shall burn it on the altar for a sweet savor, as the memorial of it to Yahweh. And that which is left of it shall Aaron and his sons eat. It shall be eaten without leaven in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meeting they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy as the sin offering and as the trespass offering. Every male among the children of Aaron shall eat of it as his portion forever throughout your generations. From the offerings of Yahweh made by fire, whoever touches them shall be holy. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, This is the oblation of Aaron and of his sons, which they shall offer to Yahweh in the day when he is anointed, the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a meal offering perpetually, half of it in the morning and half of it in the evening. On a baking pan it shall be made with oil. When it is soaked, you shall bring it in. In baked pieces you shall offer the meal offering for a sweet savor to Yahweh. And the anointed priest that shall be in his place from among his sons shall offer it. By a statute forever it shall be wholly burnt to Yahweh. And every meal offering of the priest shall be wholly burnt. It shall not be eaten. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before Yahweh. It is most holy. The priest that offers it for sin shall eat it. In a holy place shall it be eaten, in the court of the tent of meeting. All that touches the flesh of it shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood of it on any garment, you shall wash that on which it was sprinkled in a holy place. But the earthen vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken, and if it is boiled in a copper vessel, it shall be scored and rinsed in water. Every male among the priests shall eat of it. It is most holy. And no sin offering of which any of the blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burnt with fire. And this is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, shall they kill the trespass offering. And the blood of it shall, be, shall he sprinkle around on the altar. And he shall offer of it all the fat of it, the fat tail, and the fat that covers the inner parts, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the loins, and the covering of the liver with the kidneys, shall he take away. And the priest shall burn them on the altar for an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a trespass offering. Every male among the priests shall eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. As is the sin offering, so is the trespass offering. There is one law for them. The priest that makes atonement therewith, he shall have it. And the priest that offers any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has offered. And every meal offering that is baked in the oven, and all that is dressed in the frying pan, and on the baking pan, shall be the priest that offers it. And every meal offering, mingled with oil, or dry, shall all the sons of Aaron have, one as well as another." And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which one shall offer to Yahweh. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened breads mingled with oil, excuse me, unleavened cakes mingled with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil, of fine flour soaked. 
With cakes of love and bread, he shall offer his oblation with the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving. And of it he shall offer at one out of each oblation for a heave offering to Yahweh. It shall be the priest that sprinkles the blood of the peace offerings. And the, and the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall, he eat, shall be eaten on the day of his oblation. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his oblation be a vow or a free will offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice. And on the next day that which remains of it shall be eaten. But that which remains of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings is eaten on the third day, it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be imputed to him that offers it. It shall be an abomination, and the soul that eats of it shall bear his iniquity. And the flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten, it shall be burnt with fire. And as for the flesh, every one that is clean shall eat of it. But the soul that eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain to Yahweh, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from his people. And when anyone shall touch any unclean thing, the uncleanness of man, or an unclean beast, or any unclean abomination, and eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which pertain to Yahweh, that soul shall be cut off from his people. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, You shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. And the fat of that which dies of itself, and the fat of that which is torn of beasts, may be used for any other service, but you shall in no wise eat it. For whoever eats the fat of the beast, of which men offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh, even the soul that eats it shall be cut off from his people. And you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it is of bird or of beast, in any of your dwellings. Whoever eats any blood, that soul shall be cut off from his people. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, He that offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to Yahweh shall bring his oblation to Yahweh out of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hand shall bring the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. The fat with the breast may be waved for a wave offering before Yahweh. And the priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son's. And the right thigh you shall give to the priest for a heave offering out of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron that offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. For the wave breast and the heave thigh have I taken of the children of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as their portion forever from the children of Israel. This is the anointing portion of Aaron and the anointing portion of his sons out of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire in the day when he presented them to minister to Yahweh in the priest's office, which Yahweh commanded to be given them of the children of Israel in the day that he anointed them. It is their portion forever throughout their generations. This is the law of the burnt offering, of the meal offering, and of the sin offering, and of the trespass offering, and of the consecration, and of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which Yahweh commanded Moses at Mount Sinai in the day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer their oblations to Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bullock of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the door of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as Yahweh commanded him, and the congregation was assembled at the door of the tent of meeting. And Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded to be done. 
And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put on him the coat and girded him with the girdle and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him. And he girded him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod and bound it to him with it. And he placed the breastplate on him. And in the breastplate he put the urim and the thummim. And he set the meter on his head. And on a meter in front he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as Yahweh commanded Moses. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and sanctified them. And he sprinkled of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its vessels and the lava and its base to sanctify them. And he poured of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and girded them with girdles and bound headbands on them as Yahweh commanded Moses. And he brought the bullock of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock of the sin offering, and he killed it. And Moses took the blood and put it around on the horns of the altar with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured out the blood at the base of the altar, and sanctified it to make atonement for it. And he took all the fat that was upon the inner parts, and the covering of the liver, and the two kidneys and their fat, and Moses burned it on the altar. But the bullock in its skin and its flesh and its dung, he burnt with fire outside the camp, as Yahweh commanded Moses. And he presented the ram of the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood around on the altar. And he cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burnt the head and the pieces and the fat. And he washed the inner parts and the legs with water, and Moses burnt the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering for a sweet savor. It was an offering made by fire to Yahweh, as Yahweh commanded Moses. And he presented the other ram, the ram of consecration. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. And he killed it, and Moses took of the blood of it, and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the great toe of his right foot. And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put of the blood on the tip of their right ear, and on the thumb of their right hand, and on the great toe of their right foot. And Moses sprinkled the blood around on the altar. And he took the fat and the fat tail, and all the fat that was upon the inner parts, and the covering of the liver, and the two kidneys, and their fat, and the right thigh, and out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before Yahweh, he took one unleavened cake, and one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer, and placed them on the fat, and on the right thigh. And he put the whole on the hand, excuse me, and he put the whole on the hands of Aaron, and on the hands of his sons, and waved them for a wave offering before Yahweh. And Moses took them off from their hands, and burnt them on the altar upon the burnt offering. They were a consecration for a sweet savor. It was an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And Moses took the breast and waved it for a wave offering before Yahweh. It was Moses' portion of the ram of consecration, as Yahweh commanded Moses. And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments, and on his sons, and on his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron, his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with them. And Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tent of meeting, and eat it there, and the bread that is in the basket of consecration, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his son shall eat it. And that which remains of the flesh and of the bread shall you burn with fire. And you shall not go out from the door of the tent of meeting seven days until the days of your consecration are fulfilled. For he shall consecrate you seven days. As has been done to this day, 
So Yahweh has commanded to do, to make atonement for you. And at the door of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night seven days, and keep the charge of Yahweh, that you do not die. For so I am commanded. And Aaron and his sons did all the things which Yahweh commanded by Moses. Okay, next we are in Jeremiah seven twenty one through eight three. In this manner, says Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spoke not to your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Listen to my voice, and I will be your Elohim, and you shall be my people. And walk in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. But they listened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in their own counsels, and in the stubbornness of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have sent to you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they listened not to me nor inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff. They did worse than their fathers. And you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. And you shall say to them, This is the nation that has not listened to the voice of Yahweh their Elohim, nor received instruction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away, and take up a lamentation on the bare heights. For Yahweh has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah have done that which is evil in my sight, says Yahweh. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded not, neither came it into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that it shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they shall bury in Tophet, though there is no place to bury. And the dead bodies of this people shall be food for the birds of the heavens, and for the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. Then, w then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah, and from the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, and the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become a waste. At that time, says Yahweh, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun, and the moon, and all the host of heaven which they have loved, and which they have served, and after which they have walked, and which they have sought, and which they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue that remain of this evil family that remain in all the places where I have driven them, says Yahweh of hosts. Last, we are in Hebrews 9, 11 through 28. <clears throat> But the Messiah, having come a high priest of the good things to come, through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, nor yet through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, entered in once and for all into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. 
For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling them that had been defiled, sanctified to the cleanness of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to Yahweh, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? And for this case, he is the mediator of a new covenant, that a death having taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they that have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of him that made it. For a testament is of force where there has been death, for it does never avail while he that made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant has not been dedicated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and of the goats with water and scarlet, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which Yahweh commanded toward you. Moreover, the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry he sprinkled in like manner with the blood. And according to the law, I may also say, all things are cleansed with blood, and apart from shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was necessary, therefore, that the copies of the things in the heavens should be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For the Messiah entered not into a holy place made with hands, like in pattern to the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of Yahweh for us, not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place year by year with blood not his own, else must he offer, excuse me, else must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed to men once to die, and after this comes judgment, so the Messiah also, having been once offered to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time, apart from sin, to them that wait for him to salvation. Okay. Just want to remind everyone that uh, these songs that we do in interspace with the other ones all have a message in order to remind us of something. Today, kind of remind us all we're in a battle. And if you look in the world, you can see we're there. But onward, Christian soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. The cross of Yeshua, though we I saw the Lord against I messed up there. I messed up. <laughs> chorus. Well, go, we go down to the chorus. <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of 
Yeshua, going on before At the sign of triumph, Satan told us we are Christian soldiers on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the sound of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, soldier, praise and praise. Next time I bet I remember to put my glasses on. <laughs> Frank? Test and one, two. There we go. There we go. The title of this is You Got a Friend. Now, we all heard this song. I didn't, I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to tell you the words because I want you to hear what these, the words of this song is. When you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand, and nothing is going right. Close your eyes and think of me. And as soon I will be there. To brighten up even your darkest night, you just have to call out my name. And you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. Winter, spring, summer, and fall, all you got to do is call. You got a friend. If the sky above you should turn dark and full of clouds, that old north wind should begin to blow. Keep your head together. Call my name out loud. Soon I'll hear and we'll be knocking at your door. You just call out my name. And you know wherever I am, I come running to see you again. Sometimes when people go out of church and they say, boy, I wish so-and-so would have heard that message. But I don't want you to do that. I want you to take it personally. How does it apply to me? You see, I'm talking about caring about others. I'm convinced that it is a message needed by us all. As I prepare sermons, I often think of the things I need to hear. So this message is just as much for me as it is for you. 
No, I, had a, I have a nephew who's in Special Olympics, and there, there was a race with the children, a 220-yard dash. The contestants lined up in the starting line in the signal, and they started running as fast as they could. And one boy quickly took the lead and soon was about 50 yards ahead of everyone else. And as he approached the final turn, he looked back and he saw his friend had fallen and hurt himself on the track. The boy stopped and looked at the finish line. Then he looked back at his friend. People were hollering, run, Andrew, run. But he didn't. He went back and got his friend, helped him up, brushed off the cinders. Hand in hand, they crossed the line dead last. But as they did, the people cheered because there are some things more important than finishing first. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has no, not another to help him up. We do fall and we'll get knocked down at times in life. And how wonderful it is when we have a friend who cares enough to lift us up, dust us off, and help us continue on. Now turns... It, if you turn to Philippians 2, verse 19 through 30, in it we'll listen to the Apostle Paul because he is such a good example of a tender and compassionate friend. In fact, someone had noted that there are more than 100 people listed as Paul's friends in the New Testament. And one of these reasons Paul had so many friends was because he was such a good friend himself. In Philippians 2, verse 19, But I trust in the Master Yeshua to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded like who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Yeshua Messiah's, but you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Master that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Aphrodotius, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick near unto death, but Yahweh had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I send him, therefore, the more carefully, that when you see him again you may rejoice, that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Master with all gladness, and hold such a reputation. Because of the work of Messiah, he was near unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service towards me. So as we looked at Philippians, I want us to consider three important things. We need to cultivate a genuine interest in others. The first is that we need to cultivate a general interest in others. In verse 19, Paul says, I hope in the Master Yeshua to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Now, Paul's a missionary. Sometimes missionaries write appeal letters. So it would have been logical for Paul to have written a letter saying, I'm in prison here in, at Rome and conditions are really bad. I need help. So please take it, 
up a special offering and send it to me quickly. But Paul doesn't do that. Instead, he is concerned about them. So he is sending Timothy to find out how things are going. And he wants so much for the news to be good. A lot of people, weekends are check on family times, married children, call their parents, parents call their children, brothers and sisters call each other and just to visit and hear about what is happening in each other's lives. And when you hear good news, the joy is all around. Lou Garrett was first baseman in the New York Yankees and he died in uh, June 2nd, 1941. The doctors really didn't know how to treat it. So he was in the hospital for a long time and they experimented with different drugs, trying to find out what would work. Just before he died, he called a friend, Bob Considine. He said, Bob, I have great news. The boys in the labs have come up with a new serum and they're trying it out on 10 of us. It seems to be working well, nine out of 10, Ten of us. And his friend says, uh, is it working on you? And Lou answered back. He said, no, about uh, nine out of ten. How do you like those dads? He was really joyful because nine out of ten were having, having uh, help with the new serum. That kind of attitude is probably why Lou Gehrig is remembered with such fond memories because he was such a good friend. In Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, be genuinely concerned about others. Do you ever ask yourself on Sabbath, why am I going to church? Am I going because I feel I owe a debt to Yahweh, so I'm trying to pay it back? Or because I'm carrying a heavy burden that I hope will be lifted? Or because I like the music and the fellowship and even the preaching? Why am I going? Why should we go? Well, if we are genuinely interested in others, the church becomes a training ground where we learn how to help others. So when you come to church, be on the lookout. Maybe someone could use your help. Or if you're sitting near a guest here for the first time, introduce yourself and tell them, I'm glad you came. And let them know that if we can help them in any way to go in the faith. That's why we're here. When you have the prayer list and learn of someone who is having a difficult time, you could write them a card, write them a note, let them know that you'll be praying for them. Or if someone you know is struggling with a heavy burden of grief or loss, Hold their hand, maybe weep with them. Just let them know that you care. Now realize that many of you are already doing it, and I praise Yahweh for you. But isn't it refreshing to know that we can care about each other without any hidden agendas? To care about each other because you're my brother or sister? Now things happen when you're generally concerned about others. First of all, you begin to forget about your own problems. We seldom realize that. We think that when I'm having trouble, I, I need to do something just for me, something extravagant or, or indulgent. But that's not the answer. The Bible teaches us and psychologists is learning that the quickest way to get rid of troubles is to become involved in helping someone else. The prophet Isaiah knew that a long time ago. 
Isaiah 58, verse 10. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thou light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And Yahweh shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And secondly, when you're generally concerned about others, you will find that when you are, you are in trouble, others will be good friends to you. So the first thing we learn from Paul's words is that we need to cultivate a genuine interest in others. The second lesson is that we need to offer sincere encouragement to others. In verse 20, Paul says, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. <clears throat> Paul is still talking about Timothy. Paul has discipled Timothy and watched him grow in his faith. Now Timothy is an adult and has a ministry of his own. Paul looks at him and says, I don't know anyone like Timothy. In fact, the New American Standard Version translates that verse to say, I have no one else of kindred spirit. And the two Greek words used there are words that mean same soul. Paul is saying, Timothy and I are the same soul. We're kindred spirits, like-minded. Now we have different levels of friendships. Most, I suppose, are casual friendships. We know each other's name and we greet each other. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Neither of us may actually be fine, but we don't feel like unloading on each other. So we answer, I'm fine. That's a casual friendship. Some have close friendships, but we enjoy going out and spending time with each other, doing things together. It's a deeper relationship. And we care, we share things that, that shouldn't, no, wouldn't normally be shared with others. But there are very few same souls friendships where you're so close to each other that you think alike. You're motivated by the same things. It's scary sometimes to be around someone like that because they think so much like you that they know what you're going to say even before you say it. Now I want you to know that you are truly blessed if that same soul Friend is your husband or your wife. That's a very special blessing because you can come home and be who you are. You don't have to pretend. You're kindred spirits. There's love and understanding between you. Paul writes that Timothy is a same soul friend. Then in verse 21, he says, for everyone looks out for his own interests not those of Yeshua Messiah. I think Paul is presenting a contrast. He is saying most everybody else looks out for his own interests, but Timothy is not like everyone else. He's special. He's interested in you. We need friends like that. We need to be a friend like that, someone who will pick them up when they <coughs> fall down and brush them off and hold their hand, go on with the, them towards the finish line. And then there's one more lesson here. We need to practice an unselfish release. In verse 25 begins the story of Ephrodatius. Ephrodatius was a member of the church of Philippi. The church there was a strong supporter of the apostle Paul. 
So when they learned that Paul was in prison, they sent Aphrodites to be with him, to be the source of encouragement and assistance to him. But Aphrodites wasn't able to help Paul very long because he became seriously ill. In fact, he almost died. But the news of Aphrodite's illness got back to Philippi, and the people were, were concerned about him. And Aphrodite became distressed about their anxiety about him. It would have been so easy for Paul to say, well, Timothy is leaving, and now you want me to, to go, you want to go too. I suppose to do here, what am I supposed to do here in prison all by myself? Who's going to help me? But instead, Paul writes to the church of Philippi and says, I'm sending Ephrodites back to you, and I want you to welcome him and encourage him because he almost died for the cause of Messiah. A friendship that is really a friendship will release. It isn't a selfish or smothering kind of love. Those of you who are single and dating need to hear this. Husbands and wives need to hear this. And I think parents need to hear it too. There comes a time in every home when you have to let your children go. And that's really difficult too. I'd like to tell you that that's the end of the story, but it really isn't. Over in 2 Timothy 4, Paul is in prison again. And the circumstances are very different this time. His friends aren't there. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're too far away to get to him. Maybe they're, they're in prison themselves. Or dead. Or maybe they just got tired of coming to the prison. Paul's been in prison a lot. So Paul writes these words in 2 Timothy 4, verse 16 and 17. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, Yahweh, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the master stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion. Your best friend, the friend of friends, is Yeshua. He will never leave you or forsake you. And when you fall, he will pick you up, dust you off, and walk with you, hand in hand, until you finish the line. You can bet that your life on it. Yeah, we bless him. Page 28. <clears throat> 28. Oh, the Babylon. Set apart, there to be different. Oh, 
Father, we thank you for this day, for the word that we've received. We ask that you open our hearts, bury it in there so that we'll keep it with us and live it in our daily lives. We ask that you be with each and every member of our congregation this week and help us to live in service to you and to others. We also ask that you bless the food which we're about to receive, use it to the nourishment of our bodies and to further us into the service of your week. work. We ask all of this in Yeshua's name. Barak, Habab, Hashem, Yahweh, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Thank <laughs> you.